Do you want to Hello, everyone. I get the amazing privilege of uh, moderating what is the final full panel of the day. Um, and after a, an incredibly engaging day of panels, and of course, we get to look forward to that as well tomorrow, I'm noticing Susan left. I was going to thank Susan <laughs> for, as someone who was part with Adam and others, uh, Alec, wherever he's at, uh, who spent considerable time putting these panels together, This this was... Uh, no small feat. And Susan, although she's not going to hear me, I will tell her I said this. Susan and Adam worked incredibly, incredibly hard to make this happen. And so it would be remiss if I didn't uh, spend at least 30 seconds thanking them. So thank all of you for that. Okay, this panel is Data Openness and Society. And uh, I've been tasked with a series of questions, just like uh, every other panel previously today is. The panel and I have agreed that. Um, they're going to respond to the questions that they feel most uh, passionate about responding to. So I'm not gonna do the uh, sort of Socratic method that lawyers do, we've seen it down the line. Um, but we're gonna start today uh, with a question that draws upon the last panel uh, incredibly well, in my opinion. Citizens in many countries rely on large language models for a wide range of information, including scientific information. To my panelists, what are the long-term effects of such reliance? Who would like to go first? Okay, hi, so I'm Yasin Ternait. I lead the machine learning and society team at Hugging Face. And I was one of the organizers of the big science project that had the Bloom model that was mentioned a couple of times. Um, Yes, I'm going to try to be succinct and maybe like dive deeper into some of the issues. Uh, I think it's important to keep in mind that some of the issues with that specific question are about how specifically models are being used and how they're being deployed, not just the nature of the models themselves. Some of the things that I do think we want to cover if we're going to move to a state of being where most people are going to go and ask a chat model for their information are uh, the quality of the information ecosystem that we live with. Um, that's going to come through people's ability to verify information that they get and credit and funding for people who are creating the information. There's going to be issues about stereotypes and values and value injection in the technology because many of the things that you would ask a chat model are things that are subject to democratic debate and to a plurality of uh, views. And there's going to be issues about uh, concentration of information and what it means for uh, security risks. We are all very familiar with what happened with Cambridge Analytica. If we get the same kind of troves of information, that's not just people's interactions, but how they have talked to a model, that's also something that can be very damaging. So thinking about all of those things, like we have already seen some of those things happen. Um, if you remember, or I don't know if you all follow much of what's happening with the platform Stack Overflow, uh, it hasn't been doing so well. Uh, it had if you recall from his community, a very negative reaction to ChatGPT. And whereas that was a community that was very pro-open data and very into the idea that the knowledge that they were putting into the world was broadly useful and reused, the moment when technology started to accaparate their work and purport to replace their expertise, uh, that really changed feelings about whether that data should be used for generative training. We also have this idea about where credit goes. So we've seen, again, that Stack Overflow example. The other idea is, are people going to ask ChatGPT about their news? And who's going to get credited? Are we going to be in a situation where journalists are going to be working for tech companies to give them information, as opposed to, to create information that people are going to read directly and know where it's coming from? Um, okay, I think I've covered a couple of the points. Uh, most of them are tied to not having any attribution for where the information is coming from, having a concentration of the decision about what is valid information and what valid information should be presented, and having a concentration of interaction data in a way that is more complex than we've seen before. Um, I'll just say, do I have to push the button? Is this microphone working? Uh, okay, oh yeah, I've changed myself. Yeah, I'm Tom Goldstein. I'm a uh, faculty member at the University of Maryland Department of Computer Science. I work on uh, safety and security issues uh, in generative AI, and I'm a co-PI at uh, Trails, which is a co-sponsor of this event. Um, 
So I, you know, this issue of uh, of people relying on on models for scientific information and other kinds of factual information is very um, closely intermingled with this, this sort of hallucinations problem that people like to talk about. How reliable is the information you get from a language model? And I actually think I, I'm more hopeful that we can address this problem than I think a lot of other people are. I think it's totally possible to build uh, LLMs that have carefully curated data sources and provide information that's generally correct. It's just that we don't do that today. And I think one of the reasons we don't do that today is just because the costs are very high. If you look at, uh, so for example, BARD has this feature where, um, where, where you can ask it to fact check fact check things inside of something that it generates. So you ask it a question, it generates the answer, and you ask it to do a fact check, and it all it has a system. I think this is loosely based on a system called Sparrow that was built, I don't know, maybe a year and a half, two years ago at, uh, at DeepMind, but it has uh, models that go through and identify mm -hmm. things with some sort of factual parity, and then it will do some sort of query to try to validate all of those things. And so you press that button, and then the results you get back are absolutely crazy. Um, and it, it, the the quality of some of these systems that are deployed online is is very far below the technical state of the art, but that's because they are trying to offer this system for free, right? If you're going to a free search, uh, you have, you're very limited in the amount of computation that you can do. And so I think that a, a lot of people look at the failures of these systems, especially when it comes to things like hallucinations, and assume that these are failures of LLM systems at large. When in reality, they're just, they're not even necessarily failures of the current state of the art. They're just failures of the current production models that we have. And I think that as time goes on, we're going to see, I hope, we're going to see companies be um, more responsible about the things they're willing to deploy. We're going to see model sizes. Sebastian's talk was about this earlier today. We're trying to, we're interested more in small language models now than large language models. And as we see these, these small language models get better and better, I'm hoping that we see an improvement uh, in, the, in the quality of information that we get from language models. I'm Amanda Ballantyne. I um, work at the AFL-CIO. I run the Technology Institute, which is really it's a project that's focused on um, the intersection of lots of different types of emerging technology and work in the role of labor unions. So I'm not a data scientist or a computer scientist, but uh, I do spend a lot of time talking to workers and unions about the impacts of these things, particularly was you know in, in lots of conversation with the writers who were on strike this summer, SAG-AFTRA, who just uh, finish their bargaining, IATSC is going, you know, going on strike. So I'd say from like a more of a socio-technical perspective, um, you, we have a lot of questions and this might go to the cost problem that you identified about how workers are compensated for the data that they're providing that trains the models. And I think that leaves open a lot of questions about whether these models become cost efficient in every sector or not. And I think there are questions uh, that you can see in the, in the writer's guild, particularly, um, in, you know how they how they kind of settled their strike and you know under what terms they're allowed to use chat gpt it's the choice of the writer to use the chat gpt or generative ai they have to have permission for the company because there's so much open copyright questions right so i think from our perspective we would first look at the compensation and how these technologies are disrupting royalty structures for lots of different industries that are involved in creative work um, and then on the other hand we would look at how this impacts workers um, and so I talked about the, the Writers Guild settlement um, and, and what their contract looks like now, but I think we would also look at the sort of social implications and costs of the you know, potentially dramatic shift in different sectors of work and r real questions about whether um, these technologies are downgrading and de-skilling work or changing it so radically. And I think you can look at high skilled professions like the legal field and imagine what LexisNexis is considering doing next, right? And that is gonna have a really dramatic impact on the labor market of the legal field, for example. Um, other areas like education, very similar thing. You know, we have a lot of educators who are part of our teachers unions who are who think of ChatGPT as a real, you know, opportunity to reduce the time they spend with paperwork um, and training for it. But again, there's a question of like uh, reliability around the, the, you know, and does it actually end up creating other and different kinds of work because it's not as reliable, right? I, I did want to contest the cost argument. Um, I mean, I was working on retrieval augmented generation like before we had any GPT or chat GPT, and that could have been a path forward to having models that were designed to make the most of the computation to use reliable information. It was expedient to be like the first to market to have like 
first things that could be commercialized to go through the scale route and to have things that kind of try to have this information. So I think it's important to keep companies accountable for the basic development choices that they make and not look at necessarily like this is the technology that we have. How do we patch it so that some of its inherent issues are fixed? And I do think that uh, the work that Sebastian presented earlier about FI, which is looking at kind of those reasoning rather than having the information encoded, more of a promising, promising route. Sure, that's reasonable. I also think, though, it's I think that the issue of LLMs hallucinating is a bit, at least with, with, with this kind of simple next token prediction losses, I think to an extent it's inevitable. Maybe not to the extent that it happens today, but I think that to have a reliable system, you need to have uh, some sort of database of what you consider trusted sources and you have to do, you know, retrieval augmented search and you have to use some sort of entailment model to decide whether the things that are being said are consistent with what, what is being said in a reliable data source. And once you, I guess what I was getting at with the, with the cost, I think everything you said is correct, by the way, but what I think was getting at with the cost issue is that we have technologies to try to fix some of these problems better, just that once you start trying to do a really good retrieval augmented search and a really good entailment model, you end up in a situation where responding to a query might be 100 times more expensive than it already is. Um, you have to do a lot of different retrievals, and then you have to do a lot of evaluation of whether your response is, is consistent with those retrievals, um, and it takes language model queries to do all of those things. And um, I think that is a bottleneck. But what, I think what you said is, is also completely true. I think that more care could have been taken building these models in the first place. Shifting focus just a little bit, uh, but going right to sort of the heart of what some of this conversation has been, do democracies regulate chatbot speech? And if so, how? I thought you did that one. Really? No. <laughs> Uh, I think we've been over this a couple of times this today already. Uh, models are a representation of their training data. Uh, if you do not think that something should be an acceptable outcome of the model, then it shouldn't be in the training data. We are talking about misinformation. Uh, thinking about what models can do is maybe something to think about. But first, why do you have in your training data climate disinformation? Why do you have vaccine misinformation? And what in your processing choices led you to have those in a way that you couldn't or wouldn't look at? I mean, I think yes. I think particularly in the context of uh, elections and democratic speech, we, we, we have a lot of ways that we regulate speech for the purpose of election. And I think, I think training data is a place to start. Um, and I think that just making sure that, that the you know, bots are following existing election law yeah, I also don't want to hammer on this too much because it's been discussed a bit today. But I'm I'm a big advocate for the idea that you have to regulate use cases more than say language models as a whole. It's very difficult to audit a language model and say that the language model is safe because it can then be deployed to do all sorts of things like phishing attacks, misinformation campaigns, and I think you know, for some of those kinds of malicious use cases, it's almost impossible to imagine that. Um, restricting use of the API in any reasonable way is going to prevent those kinds of use cases, right? If someone asked to write an email, how do you know that it's a phishing email, right? Um, it's just very difficult to, to regulate uh, the outputs of language models in some holistic way to prevent those use cases. So I'm a big believer that the if we have some sort of regulatory framework, it has to be with respect to specific use cases rather than being with respect to you know the, the foundation model that is being deployed. Sticking with a conversation that we had a, just at the first question a little bit um, brought by Amanda. Um, could this technology lead to job loss and de-skilling? Of course, all three of you have already commented on that. But the question then goes to what, what workers are we talking about and how might we either focus a shift or reskill? How might we think through this um, what might almost be an, an inevitable de-skilling? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think that work is going to change dramatically, and I believe that when macroeconomists talk about sort of big industrial change and how it creates more productivity, I think the question is whether workers get a share of those productivity gains, and that really depends on, I think, government action, the role of labor unions, and sort of how do you start to think about equity in a, in a context when 
you know, the future workforce will get training and on ramps to this technology, but the existing workforce will struggle unless you create really clear pathways. And when I say pathways, I mean, um, you know, from either someone who's in an existing job through a training program to a new and equivalent quality job, right? And we learned from deindustrialization in the United States and sort of the hollowing out of our industrial core, we don't do just transition well in the United States. They do. In other countries, there's a more planned system, but our workforce development system is a patchwork and it's a pretty underfunded and uncoordinated patchwork. And so I think, you know, at the labor movement, we're we really call for this moment, both with the federal investments, but also with the emergence of these really, really powerful data-driven um, technologies that we actually have to rethink the way we're doing workforce development, not only career and technical education that probably needs to start like in third or fourth grade, um, creating pathways that aren't just four-year degrees, uh, making it easy for a worker to get training and upskilling, but also the networks and contacts that they need to get a job in the place where they live. We shouldn't, we shouldn't just sort of like theoretically confuse ourselves that people are able to uproot their entire families and move somewhere else for a job. Um, and so I think that how this turns out for people and how labor markets are shaped really depends on um, regulation right now and how we invest in a workforce system that can be as competitive as we want these technologies. I think adding to all of that in terms of our differentials, uh, we need to make sure that there are two versions of the technology available, one that is going to be there to augment work and one that is going to be there to supplant work. Like ideally there would be no technology there to supplant work, but since that's what's being marketed, we need an alternative that is focused on uh, augmenting work. Um, one of the, I guess, maybe surprising things in the long EO is that it mentioned uh, collective bargaining as a way towards having that. We'll see what that concretely leads to, but that would be, yes. <laughs> but that's the promising path, right? If we're going to look at market pressure, then there needs to be an incentive to shape the technology in a way that it primarily supports workers who already exist and where they can learn to integrate it in their workflows as opposed to being afraid that they will just be replaced by the cheaper alternative that will also create cheaper outcomes. So no one wins with that. Um, yes. Go ahead. Well, just on that point, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but we've been developing a set of model programs with Carnegie Mellon University. They're about upstreaming worker voice and unions in the research and development process. Exactly around sort of like, how do you, the, the idea is how do you use worker voice and knowledge to create better technology that's adopted more quickly, but is more human centric, right? So in the US, we haven't had that. We Mostly the research and development enterprise has been firms, universities and government uh, really since World War II, and now the, with the Chips and Science Act, there's a role, there's a structural role for labor organizations in the in the R&D process. Yeah, there's, also, there's a weird almost equivalence between these things, right? You can augment work or you can replace work. My uh, One of my cousins has argued with me about this a bunch. He's an attorney, and he says language models can never replace him because we're always going to need attorneys because a language model isn't going to understand, you know, the dynamics of what happens in the courtroom and blah, blah, blah. Um, but what I try to tell him is you, 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 a language model doesn't replace you by making your job irrelevant. It replaces you by making your job more efficient, right? You just, if you, if, if, if language, large language models could do document review better than people can, which I'm pretty confident that's true, um, then why do you need all the attorneys that do document review, right? Like you just don't need as many employees to do things, right? And I think that for at least for a lot of, I think for a lot of positions, um, at least in in the West, I think that's going to happen is it's just going to be this efficiency grind, right? It's not that they, they make people's jobs irrelevant, it's that they make their jobs more efficient and that could cause a major restructuring. So instead of having 10 administrative staff, you have four and then what happens to the rest? Yeah, right. Left, yeah. Um, I was gonna, I will, this is a good break because I was gonna pull to the audience now because I thought this question would get yeah, some. I just wanted to put on this one. One, one uh, difficult issue from here is that Make you don't have a mic. Yeah, it's going to make uh, everything more efficient. But one problem that I see is that it's going to replace entry-level jobs. You know, a lot of what you were talking about, this is what you start, for example, as a, as a lawyer. You know, you do document review. So what happens when this entry-level gets removed? So I don't know if you guys have, you all have some thoughts about this. Yeah, I don't know. Those jobs go away. I'm not sure what the... Here's what we say about just transition, right? Like, so so this has happened before. There have been other technologies that have been introduced that have 
um, automated some parts of uh, work. And I think in, we look at sort of the stenographer problem, you know, when personal computers became portable, you had all these really women who had been trained as court reporters and to do stenography. And now really the only people who still have that skill are the court reporters. Um, so maybe like 100,000 women or, or more like lost their jobs almost overnight, right? And the question is, um, you, you know, it's complex, like how is technology adopted? When does it become cheap enough to become ubiquitous or reliable enough to become ubiquitous? But, but there are public policy solutions, which is, you know, sort of pairing smart workforce development strategy with economic development strategy, right? And the role, frankly, of labor unions, which are very weak in the United States, but the role of labor unions in bargaining that transition for workers. So as technology is coming into the shop and starting to change what the work is, the union is both bargaining what the what the retraining and upskilling and getting, you know, the people in the existing job yeah. into the new jobs that are being formed, but then also a public policy connection that's connecting the workforce development entities that are really providing those networks and pathways for workers. Without that, I think we'll be in trouble, you know. <laughs> um, one thing I just wanted to comment on, by the way, it's sort of the flip side of this this issue, is that recently I think we're also seeing a, a an interesting globalization of tech work starting to happen. Um, you know, maybe 10 years ago, I think there was a really strong concentration of tech development happening in the U.S., and then I think it started to spread to Canada, and now Europe is taking the lead on a number of issues, uh, like, um, I mean, like Hugging Face is an example of... Uh, doing language modeling is kind of split between Europe and the US. Mistral is an example of something that's really headquartered in Europe, right? So trying to see a globalization of that. Uh, one of my former students works on the language modeling team at uh, Comcast, and they recently found out that that entire team is getting moved to India. Um, as information, it gets easier to use these tools and information about how to do um, machine learning and natural language processing just becomes broadly disseminated. I think we're starting to see a globalization of uh, some of these, you know, uh, some of these tech jobs that we don't uh, perceive as being so easy to globalize, but I think that's definitely starting to happen. Uh, I think I'll add a couple of things. One is if we're talking about just transition, time scales are going to be critical and a couple of years can make a difference. If we have a higher threshold for adoption of technology that encourages people to build more reliable and more specific systems, as opposed to just saying, you know, ChatGPT works for everything. And that buys us some important time. I will also point us to one of the more positive use cases of genera generative AI, which is uh, code generation and software uh, uh, software assistance. Um, so I don't think it is incidental that this works best for a job that is done primarily by the people who are developing the technology, right? Like a lot of the machine learning development comes from software developers. Um, and we're seeing that like roll in as something that people are adopting at their own space where like they're using it when it helps them and not using when it doesn't and kind of having this control about adoption and deciding when the technology is good for you as opposed to having it forced on you as something that you need to apply right now is going to make a huge difference. Other questions from the audience? When it's someone closer to the microphone, it's not with me. <laughs> my strategy is off. Hi, um, Kiri Wagstaff. I'm serving as an AI expert in Senator Mark Kelly's office for this year. Um, I wanted to follow up on the very first point that was made um, about hallucinations and people being dependent on LLMs in various contexts and the negative outcomes of that. Um, when I read a novel by Jane Austen and it describes people in places that don't exist, I don't feel like that's a hallucination, at least in the same sense. But if I read a New York Times article and it talks about people and things that don't exist, I do. Um, and so, you know, LLMs are great as creative writing tools, but it still puzzles me that anyone would use a generative model in search of facts. And so I wonder if this does come back, as hinted at earlier, to an educational gap. People are deploying and using these technologies and then feeling betrayed, upset, cheated, lied to. Is it just that they don't truly understand what these things are? Is there something we can do to address that, uh, to avoid those negative outcomes? I'd love your thoughts. The FTC has had something to say about overstated claims about what's... Uh, I do think that the marketing piece and how, what, how the models are presented is something that we don't necessarily talk about as much in re regulation because it's harder to like grapple with. 
but it's what shapes public perceptions about what they should be using the models for. And that's something that we want to be a lot more transparent about. Which brings us back to open technology. <laughs> uh, but open technology and uh, open data and being able to uh, check the reliability and having people like play with that technology when it's not as polished and not as ready, right? Like one of the things we've had is there's a lot less press about a lot of open source models that are like created and released as they are, as opposed to with all of the bells and whistles that really drive confidence into what they're doing. Um, oh, last thing, data transparency. We're back to data transparency. Understanding that what you're getting out of the LLM comes from somewhere as opposed to comes from nowhere and the brain of a magical entity that is a large language model goes a long way towards like having people question what they're getting a little bit more. No, it is constrained to what it's it learns to recombine the information that it has in very interesting ways, but it will eventually be something that comes from what it's saw in the training data. It's not going to repeat all of the time. Even if you're just thinking about what's been trained. That there's nothing that requires it to be true what comes out of it. Those are two different what yeah. One thing that, that, that we've seen is where you can take a truth from one piece of uh, one document and a truth from another document and combine them. So two truths become not. Right. But people are somehow expecting that truth is propagating out. Do you so, mean truth? I don't know. Yes. Yes. Like, you know, you're right. Con people have commonly to be Yeah. They, so what do you do about that? They also ask questions that they can't do the answers to. I'm going to steal an analogy from Stella because it's still the most useful. It's like, think of large language models as like a crowd of people that correspond to all of the views that you've seen in your training data. And you're going to be like a mix of like two people shouting over each other. And it's going to be something that if they all agree, maybe, and you've learned to like be consistent, is going to be in the training data. If not, you get the whole range of things. Yeah, I think it's hard to say that people aren't using them correctly. People use them the way that they use them, right? And to some extent, it is, it's a responsibility of, of organizations to try and educate people on how to, how to use them correctly. But at the end of the day, it's also the responsibility of platforms to make sure that they um, modify their moderation policies to try to mitigate the problems that are happening with their actual use cases. Um, yeah, I also, I just, I'm kind of reiterating something I said before, though, is I do think that the future of language models is going to look different than what we have today. I think that we are moving more toward complex language model systems that use things like retrieval, augmented search, uh, augmentation model, or, um, entailment models, databases, all sorts of different, you know, layers of security. And I think that in a, I think in a year or two, you might see some of these products look really different than they do today. I'm not sure that the weaknesses of today's language models are representative of the weaknesses of language model systems uh, in a fundamental way. I think it's, I, I, when I, when I hear a lot of uh, complaints about things like, especially with regards to hallucinations, I'm worried that people are overfitting a little bit to the examples of deployed models we have now, but I'm not sure that the future in two years is going to have the same landscape of problems that we're focused on today. I agree with that. I think also that, and, and I'll take it out of a computer science conversation, we do a lot with career and technical education at AFL. And that is really, you know, in some ways, students in high school are using Wikipedia, for example. That's technology, that service has been around long enough that people know that you need to fact check it against some other source that's been fact checked, right? And I think that what you're talking about is sort of a general public education about what these technologies are good at and what they're not good at. And that's always a good thing. And it should be happening in many, many contexts, educational settings, work-based settings. And the, to the extent that we're capable of educating people to identify fake news, I'm not sure. But, but you know, um, so I think, that's, I think that's one piece of it. But I also think that as you, um, you know, so, so that kind of education will eventually become just like a solidified part of how people understand the technology, um, but it, but I think that without that, we end up in a situation like we have with social media, wasn't regulated, and there haven't really been a lot of efforts to build 
educational strategies around social media. So you have lots and lots of negative social outcomes, kids with depression, democratic polarization, lots of different things like that. And I think that that's a danger around these generative AI technologies. I just wanted to follow up on Wikipedia because that's a really good way to understand some of those dynamics. Uh, people now use Wikipedia to fact check, not like use fact check. It's, true. it's and, better than it used to be. But that's the thing, like we kind of have the same problem where Wikipedia didn't used to be very reliable and those language models are currently not reliable and they're going to give you the right information in more cases as we go. I mean, I'm also like, you know, I've been following the factuality is just around the corner for a few years now. So see when we get there. But um, but the difference is that Wikipedia has traceable information, right? Like there is a governance system that is public and that is subject to democratic debate. And sometimes people disagree and we have to deal with that. We're not going to get that if large language models keep being developed the way they're being developed right now without transparency on or accountability. Thank you for this panel. My name is Laura Lai Kelly. I uh, lead the congressional modernization work at Georgetown um, and have been supporting the committee in Congress on modernization for the last four years, uh, which has done tremendous work. And you will be happy to know that there's a unionization effort going on for congressional staff. Watch it on Instagram. Again. Yay. And there's about 40, I think, chat GPT licenses. So they're letting people start to play with it to sort of, uh, for the repetitive work, like constituent correspondence or things that everybody can share. So there's a huge amount being done, just baby steps um, on using data. My question to you, you said something I think is just so uh, encouraging, which is, is to upstream labor voices of worker knowledge and more human-centric sort of the build in the humans in the loop, especially when it becomes the society, social cohesion and policies. Um, I'd like to know, where, where do you think other industries are ripe for this? I, I keep thinking of the need for a whole of nation approach, like the cooperative extension program. And then we updated it with the industrial in extension program and we need a digital extension program now. And that could be through the sort of real estate of public digital infrastructure or public sector infrastructure. I grew up in a rural county in New Mexico and we learned everything from canning pickles to you know milking goats to, <laughs> painting your house at the cooperative extension program. So I'm wondering if anybody's thought of that because it seems to be a natural muscle memory and this is the next iteration of that, but that there might be industries that are ripe for that. I'd love to know, what are you thinking about maybe the next one? Well, um, I guess two things on the, on the sort of like worker knowledge point. I, I think that we, um, workers really, really know a lot about how to do their work. And I think that, um, that knowledge is really, it's very valuable and it's very valuable to engineers. And so bringing workers in both in sort of like project identification phases where you're talking about the problems that technology should solve, you can learn a lot from a worker who could just literally say, no, that's not the problem here. This, this is actually the problem, you know? And so more guidance from people who are doing the work, I think um, at every stage in the innovation process before commercialization, Gets you better tech. The military does this. They've been doing it since the 90s because they kept developing battlefield tech that wasn't being de developed with soldiers and they were wasting tons of money, right? And so they got very disciplined about a program that really, really integrated worker voice into the design. And that's kind of where we're learning. Um, and so I think that's an important piece of it. And that can be happening at any university um, in partnership with a local labor movement or in partnership with local businesses. I will say you get more honesty out of workers if a union is bringing them in than if an employer is bringing them in to test the technology that the employer just bought or is investing in. Just um, So that's one piece. And then I think in terms of the workforce question, it's really an ecosystem question, right? So how do you think about the, um, the local institutions that are connected to, to a broad and diverse group of people? Um, and so I think extension services, certainly community colleges, um, uh, schools, but then also the community organizations, the churches, the labor organizations. Um, we used to have a more cohesive workforce system that looked probably a lot like what you experienced. I also, I grew up in a rural area, so I am familiar with the extension service. And I think that kind of localism is key because, because in order for this type of education to be relevant to workers, it has to be connected to a career pathway, right? So you want to have something that's tailored to a local labor market. 
So in every one of these panels, we have the the data openness stuff come up and most or all of the panelists say like, yeah, data openness is super important. Data transparency is super important. It's important for compliance, it's important for research, it's important for, for consumer trust. In practice, we just don't see that. Um, so like, you know, if, if, if we look at the, the group of, of people who develop and, and release large language models in, in these technologies, you know, there are, for in the case of large language models, there are three organi four organizations that have ever built a custom data set, trained models on it, and then released both the data set and the model. There are like around a hundred models, but but only only four of them actually, um, you know, have this level of, of data transparency and data openness. And, you know, as, as we saw at the, at the keynote, uh talk you know some of this is 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 legal questions within tech companies and stuff but if if data openness and, and transparency is so important to achieving good ends with this technology how do you see us getting from where we are today to where we need to be to in, in terms of data transparency I think the biggest thing we need is we just need Congress to act to clarify what are appropriate uses of uh, scraped data. If you look at like the, say, Llama 1, Llama 1 was much more transparent about its data sources, not perfectly transparent, but much more transparent. And then Llama 2 was not. And the only thing that I think changed between Llama 1 and Llama 2, as far as I can tell, is litigation. There's just so much litigation going on that that the costs of, of data transparency are huge, right? Even if you don't perceive that anything you've done is illegal, the, you know, in America, anyone can sue anyone for anything. And it's just the costs of data transparency right now are enormous. And until that cost comes down, I just hard for me to fault um, organizations for not being transparent. Um, I just, it's, it's difficult for me to, I, I, I think it's difficult to fault organizations for not being transparent if we create a system where there's very high incentives for them uh, to, to, to be non-transparent. I think uh, clearly get regime for copyright will benefit everybody, but the downward trends towards less transparency happens in many cases before any of those lawsuits. Uh, you can look at OpenAI, never known for being super transparent, but they have been giving significantly fewer data information upon each release. Like, and at some point you're like, no, but you're not sending anything already. And you're like, oh, but you find a way to say less. Um, Google and DeepMind have followed a similar trend, uh, which is probably more correlated. Like the T5 models that are put about by Google use a uh, data set that was not released as was, but was mostly reproducible, uh, and that was 2000, I don't know, 2019, thank you. <laughs> uh, and then year after year, you get less and less information before all of that came in as it was starting to be more of a product. Um, I do think so, we have heard the trade secret argument. And so legal liability, there are two things. There's copyright and there's privacy. And companies are still doing things that are very questionable from the privacy perspective, which means that even if they get clarity from the copyright perspective, they will probably still not want to expose themselves to privacy lawsuits. Uh, point number one. Point number two, trade secrets. Trade secrets has always been and will always need to be a balance. If we think that trade secrets can be taken to any extent, then we'll never have any data transparency. And it do need to be, to be uh, there needs to be a political will to say that there is a limit to trade secrets in the pursuit of good governance. And that's not an argument that's coming from any of the most of the big tech companies that are in the room and that are for good reason helping say what's possible or not but thank you i thank you all for the panel i'm chirag baines uh, until recently was at the white house domestic policy council uh, this question is for you, uh, Amanda, but anyone else can answer as well. I'm really interested in getting a little deeper into the reskilling conversation. So I just want to know how realistic do you think this is and was what is it going to take? Uh, in conversations that I've had with tech companies and, and just some of what they said publicly, a lot of them talk about UBI as a solution, uh, essentially anticipating wide-scale displacement and unemployment uh, rather than people actually getting different and better jobs. And of course, you yourself referred to how we haven't done this very well in the past. So I'm curious, what do you think? Uh, what do you think we actually need to do, and can we get it done? An alternative approach would be opposing some of this technology or trying to slow it down until we have 
uh, a, a better approach for workers. But uh, but there's not a lot of support for that, and there, of course that comes with costs as well. Yeah, I mean, I I think um, in the labor movement we don't tend to focus on UBI because we understand in a pretty deep way that people are very connected to work and it provides meaning and dignity. And I think you can look at places in the world, maybe Northern England and deindustrialization and see that that's not really like, like, you know, we believe in the social welfare state, but that's not a way to build a cohesive dynamic uh, citizenry, right? It's not good for democracy. UBA is not good for democracy if that's really the only solution we're providing. Um, different people have different points of view on that, but I think that's a pretty core approach that work is meaningful and it matters. And what's what's human about work should be preserved, you know? Um, and there are ways to do that. And there are ways to think differently about finding efficiency. And I think it comes down to questions about incentives. And given how much money the federal government is spending to develop and deploy this technology, there should be some effort put into thinking about the incentives for the private sector, certainly, but then also how do we make sure that um, we are building a comprehensive workforce system? We have the educational institutions, they exist. They're not connected and they're not focused on a core set of goals, right? And so in the 90s, when the workforce system was kind of taken apart and there was this really big emphasis placed on four-year colleges, what you lost was the connective tissue that helps everybody get good jobs who aren't going to be able to go to four-year colleges, right? So the connection between a shop class and a journeyman apprenticeship program in plumbing, for example, um, that that plumbing job, the um, social value of it was devalued because it's not a four-year education. But a plumber or an electrician who's a journeyman can make $100,000 or more a year. I mean, that is a good job, right? So I think there's both a sort of attitudinal shift that needs to happen, and that needs to happen at a leadership level, talking about what good work is. And then I think real dollars, real dollars need to be put into making um, uh, public education systems talk to each other and connect both. You know, we really frame this as a labor management partnership problem, right? So when you look at countries that do uh, workforce transition well, they have a, tri a tripartite system of government, labor, and business together that are defining what are the necessary universal skills for an industry, creating pathways, and then bargaining over things like health and safety and job quality standards. And that is what creates the pathway or the bridge for people to get from one place to another. Um, trade adjustment assistance, which is what we did in the United States for industrial workers who lost factory jobs. I mean, look at, look at any of the Rust Belt states and see how that worked, right? So we can do better. Oh, hello. Yeah, workforce development question. I'm just uh, was concerned about, like, uh, I guess, governance with the uh, K through 12 system, because particularly, like, uh, when I think about folks like myself who went through these kind of traditional scientific identity paths, uh, building foundations to get to the next level, graduate school, doctorate, and all that, there's specializations still matter. And I think a lot of the conversations tend to be how do we make efficiencies, shortcut, but you can't shortcut being a cardiologist or going into a fellowship or bypassing calculus three to get to that next level. So I guess what are we trying to, what expectations do we have at the K through 12 level with AI in terms of what they need to know foundationally? Foundationally, that, that's it. I mean, yeah, I mean, <sighs> One of the frustrating things when talking about AI policy is how much of it is not about AI. Like, and given the speed of the evolution of the technology, if you're trying to define now what a person starting grade school needs to know 10 years from now about AI, I don't think that's going to help necessarily too much. Um, I will bring us back to something that Sayesh said a panel ago, which is like we're talking about AI and misinformation while we're investing more and more uh, what's into the information protection that we have on platforms, kind of seeing a similar problem with education there. Like it's not necessarily adapting to AI, but AI is making some of the failings that we might have in current systems more apparent and exacerbates some of the disparities that they're creating. Right. 
Yeah, I keep can't figure out how to show you right in front of that. <laughs> Uh, th thank y'all for being here. I've enjoyed the panel. Um, so my name is Nick Ross. I work for Clark Construction. Um, so from a blue collar community in Appalachia, work in construction, a lot of times when I'm uh, back home or I'm on the job site and people learn what I do, which is technology now, um, and we talk about workforce displacement. I mean, the sentiment that I get is, you know, when people came for our jobs, they shipped them overseas, whatever it was, like nobody cared. So now that you know, technology is coming for journalists or lawyers. Like now it's this big thing and we need to care about it. So the question's really probably most suited for Amanda, but it's a, it's an organizing and policy question. Like when they say that, like, that's exactly what happened. So I can't, you know, deny it. Um, but like, how do you think about building like a multi-class worker movement when there's that underlying sentiment and there's like the political divides that exist on that sentiment? Um, like how, how do you approach that? I think it's a good question. I mean, that's what's sort of animating the polarized politics in in the US right now. And I, I think that what you have to say is like, the, this technology is gonna have really uneven impacts in every sector. There's gonna be a lot of job loss in the construction sector, but that's gonna be mitigated, I think, over the next 15 years by the federal investments, which I mean, we're just never gonna be able to find enough electricians to like to build the things that need to be built for the federal investments, you know? So, so I do think that, um, there will be big efficiencies in the construction sector, um, but there will be just such a demand for people. And I think the question is, how do you make sure you have enough skilled people who are up to date on the most current technology, right? So construction is a little bit different, but you're talking about sort of social opinions. And I think that if we're, if we're successful in reshoring a lot of the manufacturing, you're gonna see a diversification um, in, in the job markets that you're kind of talking about right now. And the question, I think, always with manufacturing, people assume that just because there's a manufacturing job that it's going to be a good job, and they forget how hard the UAW had to work to make those jobs into good jobs. Like, before unions existed, deciding to work in a factory probably meant you were going to lose an arm and then be poor for the rest of your life, you know? And so, so I think the question about unionization of the federal investments matters a lot. And then I think, you know, in terms of the class divide, um, what... In addition to just job loss, I think you're going to see just a transformation of work. The question is really about job quality. And like, do people in journalism really want to be just copy editors? Or do they want to be writers? And, and do you have a business model that allows uh, for the efficiency to then let those journalists go out and cultivate sources and make better news, you know, stories, right? I think the question that you're asking politically is really a question about big tech and people's suspicion of big tech. Um, and that gets thrown a lot around a lot. And again, I think I think this this sort of civic and social answer to that is to really invest in education and workforce development strategies for workers in units. Neil Neil Wasman again. I hope I'm not asking too many questions. Anyway, I, I was just wanted to maybe broaden the uh, conversation a little bit. I mean, if you go to Europe and have a conversation with someone, they won't talk about work. I mean, they'll talk about family. They'll talk about trips they've taken. In, in the U.S., the assumption of this work is identity. And maybe, chat, maybe the chatbot revolution will force us or induce us to think about the place of work in our culture uh, it used to be that the expectation was 80 work days, 80 hours of work a week, and Saturdays, maybe Sundays off and losing an arm occasionally. Uh, the expectation is a little bit different now. And maybe we need less work. You know, maybe it's a good thing that uh, people will work less and maybe pay attention to family and spiritual development or whatever they want to pay attention to. Uh, but the question is, you know, how do we determine what those assumptions might be and how do we develop policy that would allow for that transition, uh, maybe mitigating the con concentration of wealth in the country to finance creative writing among a larger group of uh, uh, members of the community? Anyway, I just wanted, may, what, what assumptions would you bring to the table uh, given the uh, uh, incentive of uh, this technological uh, revolution. Do you guys want to go first? 
I mean, as someone who lives squarely between, you know, Europe and the US, I don't know that there is a stark divide between how people think about work. There are historical and cultural differences. Um, I do want to say that uh, it's not necessarily about having this kind of utopia of less work for the same quality, because if you are a company that can pay 10 times as little money for something that's going to be half the quality that will release you like 10% of your customer base, you're going to end up with a product that have the quality and a displacement of who's making money out of the products. And that's not necessarily like, and people who are out of work, but haven't seen any of the benefits. That's kind of more what we're wanting to be more explicit about. Uh, that is something that is being addressed in regulation in some ways. We have mentioned the role of the OMB as having this like example and motivation. Uh, I was very happy to see that the draft memorandum does ask people to show that the AI is actually doing the job. And I think doubling down on that and making sure that we don't adapt just because it's expedient, but because it's actually useful is going to get us more to a place where maybe less work is coming from better quality of life. I mean, I, I think that, um, and this is, this is not going to surprise anybody, but when you, when, you, when you think about what's the counterbalance to big tech that could make sure that regular people are also sharing in the prosperity that's created instead of most of that um, value going to shareholders and, and highly paid engineers, the question is like, where's the social counterforce to that? And that has to be labor unions. And labor unions in this country are very weak. So when we think of like, what's the grand bargain, you know, in Chuck Schumer's insight forms, what is it that, that we need to see to build that equality? We need to see a really dramatic expansion of union organizing rights. And in this country, you know, there have been moments where there are big spikes in organizing and usually then there's followed by a public policy that really curtails the rights of workers. We also have very exclusive labor law in this country that doesn't allow big sectors of the workforce, gig workers, domestic workers, farm workers, really to organize under law. Public public employees can't, they have to have special laws passed to organize. Um, but, but if you're really talking about how do you sort of bargain the share, in most industries, if 20 to 25% of the sector is organized, that sets a wage floor for the whole industry, right? Because, because it changes the dynamics of competition in the labor market. And so companies then are sort of competing for the best labor. So there are sort of like labor market economic policies that could be put into place it would level out and create more ability for people to, um, you know, to make enough money to get by with just one job. Because frankly, most people in this country can't get by with just one job, right? So when people talk about the four-day work week, I'm like, that's cool. What happens to people who already have to have three jobs? <laughs> you know. Um, so I think that's the question: is like, what's the public policy that follows the federal investments or the, you know, the investment in AI that we're going to make through the Chips and Science Act? To really make sure that, that 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 is an equitable distribution. I don't think we should pussyfoot around. Like that is is creating a bulwark for workers to bargain. Let me get back to um, the notion of chatbots becoming where we go to seek information. And if that is so, um, is that on? Thank you, Lucia. So um, if that is so, um, on one hand, you know, information is free and, you know, we have the rights to spread this information and, um, you know, because as for our freedom of speech, freedom of expression rights. But it does seem to me that we need some sort of assessment that, like that chatbots are gonna be correct a certain percentage of the time if that is so. Now, I realize that that's kind of unfair. It's only gonna be as good as the data and the model weights, et cetera, the architecture of the LLM. But you know, it just seems to me like products, these are called experiments, although you know, this, the latest models are often sold. I worry that we have no guarantees with this and people are relying on it for information. And, Maybe they're suckers and that it's okay to be a sucker, like the lawyers um, who get caught. But doesn't that worry you best too? What do you do about it? I, 
try not to subject to point the finger at uh, PR and how things are advertised as opposed to having, you know, reliable results. That's one of the things. Uh, I do think that's, again, that is an important question, reliability. Uh, but what's the correct answer when someone goes and is in the middle of an election period and asks ChatGPT, which candidate should I vote for, right? Like, there's going to be, and that's one of many examples where people should not be getting their information from a system that is managed by a company to give one single answer. I think there's a mix of two things. We want to make it as consistent with the information that it has as possible. We also want to get more of a sense of boosting other sources of information. Yeah, I um, I don't have a great answer to that question, frankly, except that uh, I don't know that we have a I'm, I'm really curious to see how we can get to some sort of regulatory regime where we can manage these kinds of things. Right now we have, um, I don't know, the, 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 there's this uh, like there's this Biden uh, executive order that tries to take sort of a step in that direction by mandating that organizations have to do red teaming and then report the results to the government. It's not clear that they necessarily have the authority to to do that, right? But I think it would take. It, it just seems like we're very, very far away right now from having any sort of legal framework that can manage these kinds of risks. And it's not even clear to me at this point how to take the first step. I mean, clearly, it's a first step that needs to be taken by Congress, but um, or maybe maybe it'll be taken by local governments if Congress just sort of advocates their responsibility on this. But yeah, I just uh, it, it just seems like we're so far away from having um, any any sort of regulations that that can manage those kinds of hazards. Also, it's just not clear to me so much what what rights a company has, right? I mean, uh, um, corporate organizations endorse political candidates. That happens. Um, if if yeah yeah, like if OpenAI wants to endorse a political candidate it's very difficult to um, understand how to differentiate those kinds of statements from the statements that other organizations make. I would say there is a strong difference between OpenAI as a corporation endorsing a candidate and a product that is presented as giving objective information leaning towards one candidate, right? And that's, I think, kind of where we're trying to put the limit here. It's not necessarily telling that corporations or people in corporations, right, the head of corporations can't have opinions, but it's saying that we do need to, and we can have for requirements about how the information is being presented, right? Like one of the choices that was made, and that was a choice, was to have those chatbots interact with you as if they were a human or like mimic what a human would be saying or how they would be behaving. That's not a necessity of organizing information and giving you the information that you're looking for. You could have outputs that are simply like, as far as the model tells you, there is a 90% that these documents lead to this answer. Go check for yourself. That's not what we have right now. Um, just to follow up on the, the sorry, Bob Fay from the Center for International Governance Innovation. Um, to follow up on the point in regulation, and sorry, Susan, I know you said not to editorialize, so I'll try and make this into a question too. But, you know, one of the things I think the U.S. is trying to do, it, there is a recognition that um, these new technologies have led to increased concentration. And so that has negative implications for innovation and certainly for the work, the labor share of income and workers in general. So there's a role for, you know, regulating the use cases, as Tom said, and then there's a role for creating a, a proper regulatory framework. And one example is competition policy and consumer protection. Um, do you think that's the right way forward? Um, there's the EU approach, which is, which we didn't talk so much about, but they're regulating both the business case through the Digital Markets Act, and they're regulating the outcomes of these um, technologies through the Digital Services Act. My sense, oh yeah. uh, so I, you know, I don't have a really good understanding of, of uh, regulatory system in the EU, so my comments really pertain mostly to, to what happens in the United States. But I do think we're going to need to delegate a lot of responsibilities to regulate AI to regulatory agencies. 
and in a lot of cases that probably uh, will will result in deputizing existing regulatory agencies that handle specific use cases in specific industries. For example, finance. I can give you a concrete example of this too. I used to work for a company called Zipline that builds drones for doing medical deliveries. And um, in order to, we, I was working with them to build AI systems that would operate on delivery drones. In order to do that, we had to work very closely with the FAA. And the FAA was essentially acting as a regulator for our AI systems. And we would take all sorts of different uh, AI and perception systems to the FAA, and then they would provide us feedback. But that's because we have, we already have a, a, a regulatory regime for, for at least for aircrafts, where it's clear that the FAA is the organization that's supposed to oversee that. And that facilitated a lot of development because we always, you know, at least uh, I no longer work for this organization, but um, when you're working with a regulatory agency, you know, you, you, you can get immediate feedback on whether what you're doing is within bounds or not within bounds. And that mitigates a lot of hazards for, for corporations. I don't think that we have seen um, a lot of AI companies advocating for, for regulatory agencies. And I think part of that might just be because they're waiting to see how existing litigation is resolved. Uh, so, for example, if you look at the issue of data set curation, if it turns out that there are very strict legal requirements for, for the data sets that you're allowed to use for, uh, for building, say, large language models, I can see how uh, organizations would want there to be a regulatory agency that they could work with to stay in bounds if those requirements were vague in certain situations. But right now, those requirements don't exist. There are no rules, right? And so I don't think that there's any incentives for any uh, there's any corporate entities right now to advocate for a, a functional uh, regulatory system in the US, maybe in six months when some of these decisions come down from the courts, you might see them scrambling for, for some sort of reasonable regulatory system. But until that happens, I don't, I don't think. So stop that. It is yeah. ironic though that you have some of the major social media platforms saying, we need global regulation. We need consistency across jurisdictions. Yeah, it is like, as you point Yeah, and I don't know how to interpret that. There's a long history of, of organizations advocating for regulations that they know will never happen. It's like, you know, it's like oil companies advocating for a carbon tax in the U.S. because they know that's a, like a, a solution that won't happen. Um, but but it, but it also is true to the fact that for a lot of these organizations, they have to operate internationally. And um, it's going to make, it's going to be a very complicated legal landscape for them, especially once the AI Act comes out of the EU. It's going to be very complicated. Uh, so I think I will add, like, definitely align with all of that, but we need a mix of both. We need regulatory agencies and we need transversal rules. And they're not necessarily the rules that we've been talking about recently. One, I think, very promising piece of legislation in the EU that has unfortunately been put on hold where it's like oh, hands on deck on the act uh, is the uh, EU updated liability directive, um, which was last put forward by the parliament. And the basic idea is if you have discriminatory outcomes after adopted, uh, adopting an AI system that was known to have biases, then you are liable for the discriminatory outcome. You can't just say like, it happened somewhere, it's not my problem. Uh, and those are the kind of like things that are very targeted at the specificities of how do we, we do machine learning and the like stochasticity of the process and the fact that they gather a lot of information. I am going to call this panel to an end. So if we could thank them, and then I'm going to hand it over to a really fun activity we're going to do with you all. Thank you. So um, we're going to do something.